another Genesis study, number 55. We're going to be covering the entire chapter of Genesis 23, Lord willing. Send out a hillbilly holler to start off the uh, study to Jacques Vincent in Quebec, Canada. And I believe I pronounced that right. <clears throat> I think it's the equivalent of Jack, but I uh, knew a fella who was a um, legal immigrant from Canada, became American citizen, named Jacques. And uh, that's how he spelled his name and pronounced it. <clears throat> we love our Canadian listeners. Got a bunch of them up there. Um, man, I'd love to just go up there and hang out for a few months, <laughs> or weeks at least, get to know these people and enjoy. I love Canada, what I've seen of it. Been over there a couple of times. But uh, we're going to talk about being a stranger and a pilgrim in a different sense in this study. So let's get right in here with a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you for this time in your word. Thankful for the time to set apart this chapter and just go through line upon line, precept upon precept, verse by verse. We just pray your Holy Spirit would guide us and help us. And Lord, I just want to give the folks some of the things that come to my mind as a uh, We've studied this text, but uh, we're just thankful we hear from people all the time who are studying along with us, and you speak to them and tell them and show them things that I didn't even mention. And sometimes that's taught me. And I'm a student, a lifelong student of this book, and just pray that all the other folks listening have a commitment to be a lifelong student of the Word of God, this wonderful King James Bible. We just thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, we're going to cover the um, very sobering, somber event of Sarah's death. Um, but, <clears throat> of course, this happened nearly 4,000 years ago. So, um, it's still a tender thing. Uh, you kind of you fall in love with these characters as you read through the Bible. Some of you folks are just now starting to read through your Bible as God intended um, because you've had some bad counsel or just not taking advantage of the opportunity and some of you might be new believers and I'm just telling you that as you read through the Bible each time you go through it you just fall in love with the people you feel like you really get to know them and it doesn't matter how many times you read through it every time you come to the point where they die if you're really focused in on what you're reading it's just one of those things it's a, it's a sad thing, but it's an exciting thing because when you read about a believer like Sarah dying, we're going to meet her one of these days. I mean, it just gets me, uh, I, I get like a little kid. I get giddy when I think about it. <laughs> Meeting these people. We're going to meet Abraham. We're going to meet Sarah. It says in verse uh, 1 of chapter 23, And Sarah was 107 and 20 years old. These were the years of the life of Sarah. And in verse 2, it begins, and Sarah died. And uh, we're going to give, I, I want to stop there for just a second. I pronounce these with English pronunciation. Now, um, I think uh, if you wanted to try to transliterate uh, and pronounce these the way they're transliterated, it'd be like Kurhathaba or something along those lines. But I'm a, just a redneck American, got my plaid on today. And we pronounce it Kurjath Arba. And uh, forgive me if you think that we should try to mimic the Hebrew pronunciation. I think it would be more like Harba, Hara, Hara, Arba. Um, but anyway, uh, it says, verse 2 And Sarah died in Kurjath Arba, Kurjath Arba, the same as Hebron in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. So she's 127 years old when she dies. In Hebron, which the previous name was Kirjath Arba, and uh, the, I, I just want to emphasize, it's very important that you understand this. It, if you ignore what I'm about to say, it'll be very aggravating for you for years to come as you read the Bible. You have to understand that names change for places. Um, uh, this is an example: Kirjath Arba changes to Hebron. And it, this is all throughout human history. I've, heard, I've had people come up to me and say, why in the world 
do these cities and names change so much in the Bible? Even something like Saul changing to Paul, you know, or that sort of thing. And I, all I can say is it's just hum human. It's just the way it is. It's not God. It doesn't say God changed the name from Kirjath Arba to Hebron. God's just telling you what happened. And uh, now there are times God changed the name. He changed Abram to Abraham and Sarai to Sarah and so forth. <clears throat> but sometimes it's just what happened. And it happens all the time. You know, um, I had... Uh, I just remember being kind of blown away when I learned this about American history. New York was once called New Amsterdam. And it wasn't until, and I had to look this up, i got some information to share with you, but it, <laughs> I'm not a human encyclopedia. I don't ever want to give you that uh, kind of a, a idea because then you'll meet me in person and start asking me these questions and be surprised how much, how little I retain. I retain enough to get by, <clears throat> but New York uh, or New Amsterdam was renamed New York on September the 8th, 1860, uh, I'm sorry, September the 8th, 1664. <laughs> and so uh, before that, it was known as New Amsterdam. And so I picked up a book. I, I, I've been reading through, I'm, I don't know if I ever get done, but I've been reading through the Harvard Five Foot Shelf and some of it's garbage, but it's all useful information. Some of it's historical. Um, things like the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin and William Penn and those sort of things. And there was a reference to New Amsterdam. And um, I didn't really, it didn't click that it was talking about New York as we know it today until it mentioned that it, it was along what became known as the Hudson. Um, uh, the Hudson Bay was south of that in the book. And so I thought, well, where is this place? And I had to look it up, and I said, oh, yeah, New York was once New Amsterdam. I live in Ohio, and uh, you can actually read things written before 1803, and it refers to the Northwest Territory, and it's talking about Ohio. Um, uh, and Hebron itself, once we, we understand it's Kirjath Arba, it was named Hebron, it's, it's going to come up over and over through Scripture. So learning places and the names of these places and find out if the, you know, look it up in a Bible, a good Bible dictionary, not a dictionary like, you know, Webster's New Collegiate or anything like that. I mean a Bible dictionary. A Bible dictionary is kind of like an encyclopedia. It gives you the name and it tells you what you need to know or basic Bible information about it. <clears throat> and um, Hebron uh, will read about, like I said, going to through uh, the Bible, but it's really interesting to me when I see that it became David's um, original capital. When David was named king, he set up his capital there temporarily. And th that, again, that's happened in American history. Here in Ohio, um, the little uh, smaller town of Chillicothe was the original capital when this was the Northwest Territory. And then um, they just decided to build a city. They they decided to put a city along the Olentangy River in the central po point of the state and from scratch just started building a city. I live in uh, Worthington, which is a little north of Columbus, and it was put here because of Columbus. Uh, you know how it is. Uh, suburbs pop up and grow. <coughs> and um, I that was in uh, 1816. And then America itself I honestly did not remember this being a fact that Philadelphia served as the capital city first and then it was in July 16th of 1790 that Congress declared that uh, the capital is now District of Columbia and of course they did the same thing with District of Columbia. I think they modeled Columbus, Ohio on the same thing they did with DC. They just picked a spot and started building. And um, anyway, we'll learn more about Hebron as we continue, but you got to know, got to learn these names of places and, and places that have the same names and people who have the same names. Like Rahab is Rechab, R-A-C-H-A-B in the New Testament, that sort of thing. It just helps you study the Bible. So we'll pick, there, pick up there now in verse 3 as, uh, I, I'll just read that again though in verse 2 as we continue on. It says, And Sarah died in Kirjath Arba, the same as Hebron in the land of Canaan. And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. We'll come back to this, but th this man loved this woman. They were married uh, 
for a, more than a hundred, around a hundred years. <clears throat> we don't, I don't think we know the exact, I don't think it says exactly how old they are when they got married. Um, but we know it was right around a century. <clears throat> and uh, verse 3, And Abraham stood up from before his dead and spake unto the sons of Heth, saying, I am a stranger and a sojourner with you. Give me a possession of a burying place with you, that I may bury my dead out of my sight. And it's just an interesting thing there. It says um, that Abraham was a uh, referred to himself as a stranger and a sojourner, um, and he's the father of us all. Father of they call him Abraham, Father Abraham, and uh, the father of faith. And he's an example that uh, even though Abraham wasn't quite the same as a nomad as we think of them, but he really never did settle in in a place as like Lot does in Sodom. And in Hebrews eleven thirteen, we find all these Old Testament saints. Um, it des- describes them saying these all died in faith, not having received the promises but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. It would be another 1,800 years or so before um, the Messiah, Jesus, would come. And now it's been 4,000 years, and we're still waiting for that kingdom. It's coming. But you and I are strangers and sojourners. We're pilgrims passing through. We sing that song, um, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. And a lot of people have sung that song and did not mean a word of it. A lot of folks have sing that in church and the real reality is they're quite at home in this world. Not me. I'm really looking forward to going home, the, our real home. So in verse 5, we pick up again. It says, And the children of Heth answered Abraham, saying unto him, Verse 6, Hear us, my Lord, thou art a mighty prince among us. In the choice of our sepulchres, bury thy dead. None of us shall withhold from thee his sepulchre, but that thou mayest bury thy, um, thy dead. And it's, it's, we don't think of Abraham as a mighty prince uh, very often. At least I don't. I, can't, I won't speak for you, but I just... I don't hear him spoken of in those terms um, very often. In reality, he was a mighty prince. Um, he was both wealthy and respected. So he was considered mighty not just because of his possessions, but because of his character. And you can't really uh, underestimate the influence of Abraham on the world. Um, as I said a minute ago, he's considered the father of the those with faith, the father of faith, um, faithful Abraham. Um, he's considered the father of the Jews and others. They claim to him uh, Islam, which is totally um, bogus, <clears throat> but uh, in the sense that they didn't follow Abraham. If they'd followed Abraham, they would have followed Isaac and Jacob and so forth. But uh, you just think about it. Abraham's name kind of pops up so much we just I think take it for granted whenever the Old Testament saints died where did they go it's a place called paradise but Jesus referred to it also here again is another example where the same place has different names and uh, Jesus told the thief today thou shalt be with me in paradise shalt thou be with me in paradise but Abraham uh, his name was actually used in the story of the rich man Lazarus in Luke 16 He's in Abraham's bosom. Now, um, that is Lazarus was. The rich man was in hell. And some people have had trouble with that. It's not saying that everybody dies and goes and sits on Abraham's lap. <laughs> um, that's impossible. <laughs> um, but the, it's called Abraham's bosom because that's where Abraham and all his children are gathering, or at least were gathering until the time of the death, burial, and resurrection. So, uh, continuing, uh, oh, well, let me mention another thing. Um, we were talking about 
Abraham's influence. Think of the way Jesus described the kingdom. Um, he, in Matthew 8, 11, he says, And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. He's a man's man. I mean, there's so much you can say about Abraham. Um, and uh, he would not... I mean, a real, uh, a real picture of Abraham does not match today's effeminate, skinny jeans man. So we continue picking in verse 7, And Abraham stood up and bowed himself to the people of the land, even to the children of Heth. And he communed with them, saying, If it be your mind that I should bury my dead out of my sight, hear me and entreat for me to Ephron, the son of Zohar. And so he wants to bury his dead, but he wants to actually buy the place. He doesn't want a handout, and he's not trying to take anything that doesn't belong to him. He's not using eminent domain or anything like that. And verse 9 continues that, that he may give me, talking about Ephron, the son of Zohar, that he may give me the cave of Machpelah, which he hath, which is in the end of his field, for as much money as it is worth, he shall give it me for a possession of a burying place amongst you. Now, I, didn't, I don't think I mentioned this, but if you look on a map, you see Jerusalem, you know, kind of central. Hebron's about 20 miles south and just a little bit west of Jerusalem. That's where Hebron is. And so that's where this cave is. It's a real place. And I want to I'm emphasize that and I, as we go through the Bible constantly. Because, first of all, all, the skeptics want to pretend that the Bible is not backed up by what we know in history and geography and so forth. And that's a lie. Um, uh, I just mentioned, um, I, I hope I mentioned recently, uh, just one of the things they say that we'll, when we come to the story of Joseph, hopefully I'll remember to mention this again, but the people say, well, there's no evidence Joseph was ever in Egypt. And that's nonsense. There's even a canal that runs along the Nile River. It's called... Um, Ben Yosef, or uh, I'm sorry, Bar, Bar Yosef. And uh, there, Joseph, Yosef in Hebrew, that's not an Egyptian name. And the stories behind the canal uh, that people have been told for generations match up with the Bible. Um, and, and it's not something that, you know, st people start doing around 500 A.D. or something like that. The stories, the accounts reach back all the way back throughout the history of Egypt. And um, the fact is we're seeing a real man uh, make a uh, real transaction in a real historical place with another real man. And this land, this, uh, it's, and specifically in this instance, the cave of Machpelah, it still belongs to Abraham and his offspring bring through Isaac and Jacob. It's legal. And unlike the Book of Mormon and other unholy books um, which have no basis in reality, get your Book of Mormon out and go jump on a bus and name the places in the Book of Mormon and tell them you want, that's where you want to be dropped off. <laughs> Call the airline or go online and just look for, uh, you know, cruises that will take you to these places in the Book of Mormon. It isn't going to happen. They don't exist. But you can do that with the Bible. Absolutely. And so keep that you know, reality check as you read through this. And picking up in verse 10, And Ephron dwelt among the children of Heth. And Ephron the Hittite answered Abraham in the audience of the children of Heth, even of all that went in at the gate of his city, saying, Nay, my Lord, hear me. The field give I thee, and the cave that is therein I give it thee. In the presence of the sons of my people give I it thee. Bury thy dead. Now, um, the, this is probably cultural. We're taking it for granted that it is, but probably a cultural thing where someone wanted to bury their dead and they asked for a plot. Someone said, oh, it's yours with the expectation that the person, unless they're dirt poor, um, they're not going to take it and just not give you anything. And, uh, you know, it, it's a gesture, and it, there's nothing wrong with that. 
But uh, Abraham, being a man of character and of wealth, responds, it says in verse 12, And Abraham bowed down himself before the people of the land. Verse 13, And he spake unto Ephron in the audience of the people of the land, saying, But if thou wilt give it, I pray thee, hear me, I will give thee money for the field. Take it of me, and I will bury my dead there. So he's saying, all right, if you're willing to give up the piece of land, that's great, but I'm going to pay you for it. So take the money, and then I'll bury my dead. And um, continues in verse 14, And Ephron answered Abraham, saying unto him, verse 15, My Lord, hearken unto me. The land is worth 400 shekels of silver. What is that betwixt, betwixt me and thee? Bury therefore thy dead. So you see how this works? It's like, oh, well, you know, it's worth 400 pieces of silver. But, you know, between me and you, that's nothing. I don't care about the money. I want you to just bury your dead. So it's a gesture. But it's, uh, it shows character on Ephron's part. And then, of course, Abraham, verse 16, says, And Abraham hearkened unto Ephron, and Abraham weighed to Ephron the silver, which he had named in the audience of the sons of Heth, 400 shekels of silver, current money with the merchant. So he didn't try to... Um, it, there's a term that I heard growing up all the time, Jewing people down. <laughs> and, and it's supposed to be an insult. And if there's any Jews out there listening, I thought it was a compliment. I don't, I don't say it anymore. If I ever do, it'll be a slip of the tongue because I know it's supposed to be offensive. But uh, I thought, you know, I'd love to be able to Jew people down if it's going to save me money. <laughs> but I came up the, from southern Ohio, moved up to Columbus one day, and I I had bought a car, and I mentioned that I had Jewed somebody down a couple hundred bucks on it. They're like, you what? <laughs> and that's when I, the light bulb started going off. You know, I'm going to have to watch what I say. There's things that were said in southern Ohio that uh, might be offensive to these northerners, you know, Yankees. So I've had to watch it. But really, that term isn't meant as a as an insult but here Abraham doesn't try to uh, bring him down on the price uh, Ephron named the price Abraham uh, uh, counted out the what it says counted out the 400 shekels of silver it says current money with the merchant and that's currency that's what it is current money currency that's what when we say something's currency we mean it's current money if you try to use Confederate money, for example, it's not current money. It's not accepted as currency. So the King James Bible is not as out of date as everybody tries to pretend, once again. So uh, pick up that now in verse 17. And the field of Ephron, which was in Machpelah, which was before Mamre, the field and the cave, which was therein, and all the that were in the field, that were all uh, were, were in all the borders round about, were made sure. So it's like a cemetery plot. Probably a beautiful piece of land with a cave. Verse 18, And unto Abraham for a possession in the presence of the children of Heth before all that went in at the gate of his city. Um, so this was uh, really a binding deed. This text, the scripture itself, the Torah, has served as a binding deed for that property. And I... We have to think of these things in those terms. This is real stuff. This is as good as having something down at the county municipal building in the uh, county uh, clerk's office. It's, it's better, actually. So uh, verse 19, And after this, Abraham buried Sarah his wife in the cave of the field of Machpelah before Mamre, the same as Hebron in the land of Canaan. And the field, we'll go ahead and close, the, let's read that last verse. And the field and the cave that is therein were made sure unto Abraham for a possession of a bearing place by the sons of Heth. So we started really, uh, I, I wanted to save this till the end. We started right where we finish with uh, Abraham burying Sarah. And verse 2 it said, uh, And Sarah died in Kirjath Arba, the same as Hebron in the land of Canaan, um, which is what we just read in verse 19. And it says, And Abraham came to mourn for Sarah and to weep for her. So it's a very tender scene. You know, they've known each other since birth. They were half brother and sister. And we've seen that with the scene with the Pharaoh and with Abimelech. Um, you think about married for a century. Right around, give or take. A hundred years together. 
I mean, they were just a part of each other. And that's what marriage is supposed to be. You become one flesh. There's supposed to be a lasting love and commitment. People these days don't get married with that in mind. Um, you know, you, you demonstrate your love and commitment for one another, and one another by overcoming flaws and failures. You have flaws and failures. Your spouse is going to have flaws and failures. You don't answer that by going to divorce or having an affair as the nice little word they put on adultery these days. <clears throat> and it's only going to really work. I've seen, you know, there's instances of unsaved people staying married, but they don't have the kind of love relationship in the true sense of the word. Because to really have a love relationship and a marriage based on love, you have to have a binding love for God and for each other. And uh, in my marriage, um, my wife is able to over, overcome my flaws. She's able to deal with my physical flaws. I have health issues that <clears throat> probably a lot of women would never put up with. <laughs> and uh, we're both flawed and we both know it. We love the Lord and we love each other and we're committed to making it work. It's that simple. And anybody with that attitude, the attitude of 1 Corinthians 13, uh, 12 and 13, is that marriage is supposed to last until we're in the Lord's presence. Um, Abraham and Sarah, they were married until her death and they reunited in paradise. And that's the way it, all Christian marriages should be that way. I refer to 1 Corinthians 13, 12 to 13. It says, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as <clears throat> also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity. These three. But the greatest of these is charity. And the world just doesn't even know what love is. Uh, it's charity in the true sense of the word. Um, and you can see kind of the relation between the word charity and care. Caring. Charity, care, caring. You care for the needs of the other person first. Um, you want to protect the other person. You want to you um, take their feelings and their sense of being loved into consideration. Um, some of the, there are marriages that last, but they just don't, especially men, sadly, but I've seen women as well, give no consideration to the feelings of the other person, the sense of being loved, and it's just a stale, dry relationship. And if you you live by this law of charity, define love by the law of charity, um, then you'll, you'll want to consider the well-being of the other person first. And so accounts like this one of Abraham and Sarah, they're the world's greatest love stories. And uh, it's not about sex and drama. It's about real love, charity. Love for God and love for each other. And let these stories, these accounts, be the models that we try to live by in our own lives as married couples. solid King James Bible preaching and teaching, along with the encouragement of the psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, tune in to our internet radio station available every day, 24 hours a day, at bbfohioradio.com. Join listeners from over 150 nations, all 50 U.S. states, and other U.S. territories who are tuning in and receiving free Bible teaching at bbfohioradio.com.